Welcome to a series of lessons introducing the fundamentals of unsaturated soil mechanics. My name is Dale Fredlin and I am Professor Emeritus at the University of Saskatchewan, Saskatoon, Canada. The six lectures to be presented are of a basic nature intended to introduce unsaturated soil mechanics at the undergraduate and graduate engineering levels at universities. It is also hoped that the notes will be of assistance for the implementation of unsaturated soil mechanics into geotechnical engineering practice. A total of six lectures have been prepared. The lecture notes are largely based on the 2012 textbook titled Unsaturated Soil Mechanics in Engineering Practice, published by John Wiley and Sons. Lecture number one introduces the subject of unsaturated soil mechanics and shows examples to illustrate practical problems. Lecture number two presents the fundamentals of state variables and their measurement. This is the starting point for an applied science in soil mechanics. Lecture number three describes the constitutive relationship known as the soil water characteristic curve or the SWCC. It is also referred to as the water retention curve. Lecture number four deals with water flow through unsaturated soils. Lecture number five deals with the shear strength and its application. And lecture number six deals with volume change and its application. The intent of the lectures is to introduce unsaturated soil mechanics within a framework that is consistent with classical soil mechanics for saturated soils. In the process, soil suction is incorporated as an independent variable, amenable to measurement and calculation. It must be appreciated that there is a limit to the amount of material that can be covered on such a broad subject as unsaturated soil mechanics in just a few lectures. Unsaturated soil mechanics will be treated as an extension of the phenomenological continuum mechanics approach that has served so well for the application of saturated soil mechanics ever since its inception in the 1930s. There are two synonymous terms that have been used to describe the portion of the soil profile above the water table. These are the Vado zone and the unsaturated soil zone. The term the latter term is more appropriate for geotechnical engineering. The unsaturated soil zone can be divided into three subzones. These zones have been given the following names, the capillary zone, the two-phase zone, and the dry zone. Each zone having different degrees of continuity with respect to air and water phases. The United States Geological Survey has described the unsaturated soil zone as that part of the earth between the land surface and the water table. Consequently, the unsaturated soil zone is more closely related to the stress state in the water phase than it is to the degree of saturation. In other words, it is the negative pore water pressures that uh, identify the unsaturated soil zone. The unsaturated soil zone can be divided on both a local and regional basis as shown in this slide. The soil in the capillary zone may be close to that saturation with the water phase continuous and the air phase being discontinuous. The break between the capillary zone and the two-phase zone is defined as the air entry value of the soil. It has a distinct change in the degree of saturation at that point. The two-phase zone has both the water phase and the air phase behaving as continuous flu fluid phases. If the net flux at the ground surface is negligible and the soil profile is sufficiently deep, then a dry zone will exist near the ground surface where the water phase is discontinuous and the air phase is continuous. There is one set of equilibrium conditions in the water phase that assists the engineer in establishing a link between 
the field conditions and laboratory conditions. It is the condition where the net moisture flux at the ground surface is zero. Under this condition, the pore water pressure stress state is linear with respect to depth for all types of soils. It is referred to as the hydrostatic stress state. It is noteworthy that while equilibrium pore water pressures are linear, the quantification of the amount of water in the soil will reveal two distinct breaks referred to as the air enter value and residual conditions. The amount of water in the soil versus the negative pore water pressure or soil suction constitutes the soil water characteristic curve or the SWCC. The SWCC will later be shown to form a vital link between field conditions and laboratory testing. The reality is that we do not live in a world though where the net moisture flux at the ground surface is zero. Rather, the moisture is either falling on the ground surface as precipitation or it is leaving the ground surface as evaporation or evapotranspiration. This means that the ground surface constitutes a moisture flux boundary condition. The moisture flux boundary condition results in perturbations in the stress state of the soil near the ground surface. Handling the moisture flux boundary condition adds a challenge that is, is a new dimension for geotechnical engineering applications, but it is important. The ground surface actually imposes two independent boundary conditions, namely, a thermal flux boundary condition and a moisture flux boundary condition. Information on the ground surface are, are routinely collected by weather stations. Weather station information can be viewed as a valuable resource for geotechnical engineers. Recording of rainfall and snowfall conditions provides direct information on the downward moisture flux. Temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, and net radiation provide information useful for the calculation of evaporative moisture fluxes. Engineers use climatic weather station data to estimate plausible conditions that might exist in the future. We say climate is what you expect to get, while the weather station tells you what you actually get. Our desire as geotechnical engineering is to develop a science-based methodology for unsaturated soil mechanics. There are three primary so-called pillars that need to be addressed. First, there needs to be engineering protocols. Protocols are procedures of practice that are based on sound research studies. Second, there needs to be laboratory soil testing procedures that are not too costly to perform, but which provide sufficient information for the estimation of unsaturated soil behavior. Third, numerical modeling techniques need to be available since the soil properties are nonlinear and this requires the solution of nonlinear partial differential equations. It should also be noted that there are a series of additional analyses that may need to be uh, uh, performed in order to quantify the moisture flux boundary condition. Let us start by acknowledging the significant contributions that have been made in the soil science and soil physics disciplines. Their primary interest and application was founded in agriculture. Their primary process of interest was the movement of water through unsaturated soils. They were the first to measure the soil water characteristic curve and to use it to estimate hydraulic properties such as conductivity and water storage. Agricultural applications started in the 1920s. Geotechnical engineers had an interest in water flow through unsaturated soils, but they also had an interest in shear strength and volume change of unsaturated soils. 
Their research started in earnest in the 1950s and 1960s. Slowly it was found that the soil water characteristic curve could be used to estimate the shear strength and volume change properties of unsaturated soils. The contribution of the soil water characteristic curve to unsaturated soil mechanics should not be trivialized. Kloot in 1965 provided a summary of the complex nature of the soil water characteristic curve. The soil water characteristic curve was plotted as the amount of water in the soil versus soil suction. He suggested that the soil water characteristic curve actually consisted of a family of curves. These were described as the initial drying curve starting with the soil wetted to near 100% degree of saturation. Then there was the main drying curve starting from a naturally wetted condition. And thirdly, there was the main wetting curve that was defined after the soil had been dried and then was being re-wetted. In addition, there could be scanning, drying, and wetting curves defined by the limiting main drying and main wetting curves. The soil water characteristic curve was recognized to be complex in nature, but still of significant value for simulating unsaturated soil processes. Clute in 1986 described a number of features of the soil water characteristic curve that are proven to be of value in analyzing the behavior of unsaturated soils. He stated, the soil water characteristic curve is a fundamental part of the characterization of the hydraulic properties of a soil. He stated that soil suction is an energy per unit volume and as such is a pressure state. He stated that soil suction can be defined as matrix suction up to around 1500 kilopascals and then total suction in the range from 1500 to 1 million kilopascals. The amount of water can be expressed on a weight basis or mass basis, a volume basis or a degree of saturation basis. He stated that the soil water characteristic curve was hysteretic but mainly defined by the main drying and wetting curves. There are concepts from soil physics that should be retained within geotechnical engineering, while there are concepts that need to be modified. First, the concept of estimating unsaturated soil property functions from the soil water characteristic curve has great possibilities and should be retained. Secondly, always starting with a saturated soil specimen allows a standard procedure for obtaining a thumbprint soil property. Thirdly, stress path effects can be accommodated as part of analytical modeling procedures. Concepts that need to be modified are as follows. The effect of volume change with suction change needs to be considered. This can be done through the additional measurement of the shrinkage curve. Secondly, defining the pivotal points on the soil water characteristic curve is important. The, these pivotal points are the air entry value the rate of desaturation and residual suction conditions. Let us do a brief review of some of our basic understanding of soil as a multi-phase system. In geotechnical engineering, soils are classified mainly in terms of their grain size distribution and their plasticity properties, in other words, the Atterberg limits. Both classification properties take on additional meaning when attempting to quantify unsaturated soil behavior. Understanding the interaction between air and water is also important for many applications. For example, air dissolves in water. The air-water interface, known as the contractile skin, plays an important role in understanding 
basic physical behavior of unsaturated soils. The contractile skin or the air water interface is extremely thin, but is known to have properties that are different from the contiguous water. Consequently, an unsaturated soil should rightfully be referred to as for a four-phase mixture, namely a solid particulate phase, an air phase, a water phase, and a contractile skin phase. If we desire to observe the importance of the contractile skin, just form a ball of wet clay soil and watch it change volume as it dries by evaporation to the atmosphere. It is the contractile skin that is responsible for the observed volume change. <clears throat> the volume and mass relations for an unsaturated soil are topics that are covered in soil mechanics textbooks and will not be elaborated upon in this lecture. I will simply note that the volume and mass of water in the, the contractile skin can simply be combined with the overall water phase. However, when considering stress state equilibrium, the contractile skin must be given consideration as an independent phase. The interaction between the phases of an unsaturated soil, that is air and water, are also important in understanding and will be discussed briefly. Once the specific gravity of a soil is fixed, the most commonly used volume and mass relations can be shown on a single plot of volume variables versus gravimetric water content as shown in this slide. It can be seen that the saturated soil falls along a single line with the degree of saturation equal to 100%. This is the only line of interest really in saturated soil mechanics. Also shown is the useful relationship referred to as the basic volume mass relationship, referring degree of saturation, void ratio, and gravimetric water content. There are interactions that take place between the air and water and these are important in understanding unsaturated soil behavior. One interaction occurs because water has about 2% voids that can be occupied by air gases, nitrogen and oxygen. The voids in the water are referred to as cages. While these cages exist, the water still forms a rigid structure that renders the water essentially incompressible. The amount of gas that can be dissolved in the water is governed by Henry's law. In other words, the mass of air is a function of the absolute air pressure. For example, changes in barometric pressure are also changes, cause changes in the amount of gas dissolved in water. A spring and piston analogy can be used to illustrate the complex interaction between air and water. The piston and spring are used to show the immediate volume change of a mixture of air and water. It occurs in accordance with Boyle's law. This is followed by a slow solution process that occurs as further air is slowly dissolved in water. This behavior is analogous to the immediate and time-dependent processes associated with the consolidation of saturated soils. The above example is simply used to illustrate the complex physical interactions that can occur in an unsaturated soil mixture. I previously mentioned that the conventional classification properties of a soil have increased significance when trying to anticipate unsaturated soil behavior. The grain size curve provides in information on the percentage of various particle sizes. This inf information can be used to infer the soil water characteristic curve of a soil. <clears throat> the shrinkage curve associated with the shrinkage limit test 
provides information on the relationship between overall volume change and the amount of water removed upon drying. It also indicates the minimum volume that the soil can attain upon drying. The plastic limit in terms of Atterberg limits provides information on the air entry value of the soil. The grain size distribution for sand indicates the amount of material associated with a particular particle size in terms of mass distribution. In a sense, it is the inverse of the solids distribution that is desired for the estimation of the void distribution, <clears throat> which forms the basis for the soil water characteristic curve. Consequently, there are numerous so-called pitot transfer functions that have been proposed for the estimation of the soil water characteristic curve from the grain size distribution. Each method makes use of the capillary tube analogy and has an integration process to estimate the plausible soil water characteristic curve. While it is recognized that the pitot transfer function calculations are approximate, they are indeed useful as an estimation tool. Examples of the pitot transfer function that can be used to predict the soil water characteristic curve have been proposed by Era and Paris in 1981 and Murray Fredlin in 2000. This slide shows a comparison between the drying soil water characteristic curve estimated by the Murray Fredlin pitot transfer function for sand, along with the measured soil water characteristic curve. The pitot transfer functions are known to be more reliable for uniform sands than for other soils. However, they still are considered to be a valuable tool and are used for many soil types in geotechnical engineering. <clears throat> The Atterberg limits of a plastic soil have been adopted as the standard classification tool worldwide. The Atterberg limit test procedures are somewhat crude. However, they have stood the test of time. The soil is first remolded at a high water content and then allowed to dry. A shrinkage curve can be plotted with the void ratio on the ordinate and the gravimetric water content on the abscissa. The soil dries in a manner similar to applying a gradual increase in suction. As the plastic limit of the soil is reached, the rolling of a thin, thin uh, thread of soil begins to crumble. This point is known as the indication of the water content corresponding to the plastic limit and the air entry value of the soil. Complete oven drying of the soil corresponds to a soil suction of about 1 million kilopascals. <clears throat> the primary tool used for the estimation of unsaturated soil property functions is the soil water characteristic curve. The soil water characteristic curve is commonly measured and plotted as gravimetric water content versus soil suction ranging from about 0.1 kilopascals to 1 million kilopascals. Combining the measured soil water characteristic curve with the shrinkage curve allows the soil water characteristic curve to be calculated and plotted in terms of volumetric water content, degree of saturation, and void ratio, all versus soil suction. In other words, there are a family of possible soil water characteristic curves that can be calculated and plotted. This in turn allows for the use of the appropriate soil water characteristic curve relationship when calculating unsaturated soil property functions. The soil water characteristic curve <clears throat> is generally measured in the laboratory and plotted as gravimetric water content versus soil suction. The main drying curve is the easiest relationship to measure, and for this reason has become the reference curve when considering other drying and wetting paths. 
It should be noted that the soil sample is always allowed free access to water prior to the start of the test. In other words, soil suction is reduced to zero. The soil is then placed in a pressure plate device where increments of suction are applied. The test procedure is largely dictated by the protocols that have been used in agriculture. These protocols have some limitations associated with the test procedure, but it is important to be able to define a basic unsaturated soil function over the entire range of soil suctions. Due to the many possible soil water characteristic curve relationships, it is important to develop terminology that ensures clarity as to which variables are being discussed. It is suggested that the soil water characteristic curve variable used as a prefix of uh, as W, S, theta, or E to designate gravimetric water content, degree of saturation, volumetric water content, or void ratio respectively. This provides an indication of the volume mass variables that are involved. It is also suggested that a suffix variable be used, the suffix variable being I, D, W, and DS, and D, and WS, to the used to differentiate the branch of drying and wetting soil water characteristic curves. The terminology is somewhat cumbersome, but it is important that geotechnical engineers speak with consistency and clarity concerning the variables involved. <clears throat> the measurement of the soil water characteristic curve and the shrinkage curve are both drying processes following the same suction stress path. It is possible to combine these results and in so doing, calculate other volume mass relationships versus soil suction. In so doing, it is possible to separate out the contribution of soil suction that goes towards producing volume mass changes volume changes and the portion that goes towards changing the degree of saturation of the soil. Families of various volume mass soil water characteristic curves can be calculated based on the gravimetric water content soil water characteristic curve and the shrinkage curve. The most important set of curves to calculate are those related to the main drying process. Possible relationships that can be calculated are void ratio versus soil, soil suction, degree of saturation versus soil suction, volumetric water content versus soil suction. Each of the volume mass soil water characteristic curves has a particular role to play in understanding unsaturated soil behavior and the estimation of unsaturated soil property functions. It is possible to separate out the effects of volume change from changes in degree of saturation of the soil by performing the above mentioned calculations. The air entry value of a soil should only be determined from the drying degree of saturation soil water characteristic curve. The same is true for the assessment of residual conditions. Estimations of hysteresis effects appear to be best determined from the degree of saturation plot. The assumption is often made that the drying and wetting curves are congruent or parallel on a semi-log plot. And then this allows for an estimation of the water entry value of the soil. <clears throat> the question might well be asked, why did it take so long for unsaturated soil behavior to be studied for geotechnical engineering applications? A person might almost come to the conclusion that there is little need for the application of unsaturated soil mechanics. However, this is far from true. Unsaturated soils occur near the ground surface 
and the stress state within these soils is undergoing continuous change due to ongoing interaction with the above ground cl surface climate. It is clear that unsaturated soil behavior is considerably more complex than saturated soil behavior, but it is still very important. There are several unsaturated soils application areas that have been studied uh, uh, in detail even before we have the science-based framework that I'm talking about. One such soil category was that of expansive or swelling soils. A series of expansive soils conferences were started in 1965 in an attempt to draw attention to the serious problems associated with expansive soils. It would take several international conferences before it became apparent that expansive soils were simply one category of the broadest subject, broader subject of unsaturated soil mechanics. Expansive soils were generally noted to be high plasticity soils with natural water contents near the plastic limit. Typical problems associated with expansive soils were ill illustrated at the conferences along with pictures of cracked buildings. In Canada, for example, houses are built with basements mainly to get around the frost conditions. The excavation for the basement unloads the soil generating a tendency for the soil to subsequently expand upwards. In addition, the removal of surface vegetation and the construction of a house greatly reduces ground surface evaporation and evapotranspiration. Measures are often built into the design of the foundation to compensate for future movements, but all too often movements take place and damage occurs because the owner does not pay attention to the, the remedial steps that he should have followed. Damage due to expansive soils are reported to be annually greater than all other natural disasters in North America. Residual soils were slow to be recognized as another category of unsaturated soils. These were soils that had weathered from parent rock materials. They were often of low plasticity, but were often known to not obey anticipated saturated soil behavior. Collapsed soils and compacted soils would also be recognized as another important unsaturated soil category where geotechnical engineers become involved. It is noteworthy that compacted soils form by far the largest application areas involving unsaturated soils. Compacted soils are a part of virtually every project undertaken by civil engineers. Consider, for example, the design and construction of roadway embankments and earth fill dams. Excessive long-term rainfall is often found to raise the phreatic line and increase the pore water pressure in the upper portion of the dam, thereby reducing the factor of safety of the dam and even producing failure in some cases. Natural slopes are a serious problem in many countries of the world. Failures commonly occur following periods ex of extended moisture infil infiltration at the slope surface. Clients would like to know where and when the rainfall conditions uh, of a particular slope will cause failure. These cause Challenging are challenging questions that are often asked of the geotechnical engineer. The answer to these questions involves an ability to model seepage through unsaturated soils. Real-time climatic conditions become the boundary conditions for studying possible slope instability. Soil cover systems have become an often used solution in the mining industry for the control of chemical movements into underlying groundwater systems. The soil cover must be able to store water 
during periods of excessive rainfall, while subsequently releasing the water back into the atmosphere through evaporation. Their functionality has given them the name store and release cover systems. Records of past precipitation, rainfall, and temperature conditions become the boundary conditions for modeling the behavior of soil covers. The advent of the computer has brought about the ability to numerically model moisture flux boundary condition problems. For this reason, the analysis is often referred to as a boundary value problem. The seepage analysis for unsaturated soils involves being able to derive <clears throat> the physical relations related to a single element of the continuum. The element is referred to as a finite element. And the mathematical equation takes the form of a partial differential equation referred to as a PDE. The PDE is generally nonlinear since the soil properties for seepage are nonlinear equations. As a result, the solution requires an iterative process and the computer becomes a necessary tool for solving seepage problems. The equation at the bottom of this slide is a partial differential equation for unsaturated and saturated flow of water through a porous media. There are two soil property functions that are required in order to solve this equation. These are the permeability function, K sub W, which is primarily related to the degree of saturation of the soil, and the water storage value, W2, uh, M, MW2, which is related to the volumetric water content function. Further explanations related to solving this equation will be given in the lecture on flow of water through unsaturated soils. The last three slides to be presented in this lesson show, on a broad scale, the relationship between the soil water characteristic curves and the soil property functions. The first slide shows that the permeability function is obtained by starting at the saturated coefficient of permeability and integrating along the degree of saturation SWCC to arrive at the permeability function. It is noted that the integration process commences at the, at the air entry value of the soil. Only the permeability soil property function needs to be defined when solving steady state seepage problems. The water storage function must also be defined when solving transient or unsteady state seepage problems. The water storage function is obtained by differentiating the volumetric water content SWC. Once again, the water storage function can be seen to be highly nonlinear. Clearly, the soil water characteristic curve plays a pivotal role in the estimation of the unsaturated soil properties. The next slide illustrates the generation of a finite element mesh for an earth fill dam. The dam consists of two materials, namely a lower permeability core material surrounded by a more pervious shell material. The solution is shown for steady state seepage conditions. The contours in the uppermost cross section show the dissipation of hydraulic head conditions through the saturated and the unsaturated core and the shell materials as well. Unsaturated soil behavior has emerged as a science because its physical processes such as seepage, shear strength and volume change can be described in terms of changes in the independent stress state variables. The ecliptic, uh, elliptical world in the, shown in the final slide of this lesson simply il illustrates why two independent variables are needed. Simply stated, it can be explained that two stress 
variables are required for unsaturated soils because changes in the total stress variable produce a different effect than changes in the pore fluid stress variable. The remaining lessons will show how classic so saturated soil mechanics formulations can be extended to embrace a wide range of unsaturated soil property functions and problems. Thank you.